As a COVID doctor, a lot of people have been asking me about the Pfizer vaccine. Wouldn't it be so convenient if you had a friend who not only just got back from getting microchipped, who not only just got back from getting the Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine, but has also read through the entire FDA briefing document? Well, you're in luck. I'm Dr. Justin Skrinsky, MD. Since March, I've seen hundreds of COVID patients and probably walked into a COVID room like 1,500 times. In fact, I'm so good at walking into COVID rooms that they featured me on NBC Nightly News. A couple days ago, I drove out to get the Pfizer COVID mRNA vaccine. This is one of two doses and I'll be going back for the second dose in about three weeks. Honestly, getting this vaccine was pretty meaningful to me. We might think it's quite to watch old videos of people do their civic duty and line up in their Sunday best to get the polio vaccine. But honestly, when I got my shot, I was pretty emotional and I felt pretty proud. I've seen enough people suffer and die from this disease and to finally have a light at the end of the tunnel of this pandemic. Okay, Q&A time. But first, critically, subscribe if you find this video useful and to get all future updates as they come. Remember, every subscription is one more anti-COVID antibody in my bloodstream. It's science. Actually, no, it's not. Actually, it's probably even a little bit unethical to say. But the burning question. No, there is no microchip in either the needle or the vaccine. If an imaginary invisible technology is more believable to you than an mRNA vaccine, well, good luck. But for all you rational people, here's a list of some of the questions that we'll go over. You can either watch them all or you can skip to the timestamps listed in the video description below. Let's tackle the first question. How does the vaccine work? Even though some of the core principles of mRNA technology will also apply to the Moderna vaccine, specifically for this video, we'll be talking mainly about the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, specifically a BNT 162B2, a lipid nanoparticle formulated nucleoside modified RNA with two proline mutations. Thank you. I did a little video on mRNA vaccines, which I will link here. In a nutshell, your DNA is like the reference book in a library. You can read it, but you can't check it out of the nucleus. The mRNA, M, is the copy that you take out of the library. So in this case, meaning going from the nucleus to the cytosol of the cell. The mRNA is then used as the template to make the finished product, which is a protein. With an mRNA vaccine, we inject mRNA, which we make in a lab. This codes for the viral spike protein, which is the little knobby things that you see on the outside of the coronavirus. Your own cells, they make a bunch of this spike protein. Your immune system sees this and then forms a response against it. This contrasts with a traditional vaccine where we would just straight up inject a piece of the germ for your immune system to recognize. This is a bit more how the AstraZeneca vaccine works, but that's kind of another story. Once your immune system is keyed up to go after spike protein, if coronavirus ever shows up covered in spike protein as it is, your immune system immediately recognizes that as something that's gotta go. Next, can the vaccine alter your DNA? A lot of people are concerned about the vaccine altering your DNA, a phenomenon called insertional mutagenesis. The short answer is no. The long answer is no. mRNA can't enter the nucleus, which is basically the citadel where your DNA is stored. mRNA is also non-insertional, meaning that it can't insert itself into your DNA. Even if somehow a wayward wisp of RNA somehow made itself into the nucleus, which it can't, it wouldn't be able to plop itself into the middle of your DNA and change it anyway. After it's done making a protein, mRNA gets recycled in the cytosol, which is all this goop swirling around in the cell outside the nucleus. Different studies estimate the half-life of mRNA anywhere between several minutes and about 10 hours. But complexing the mRNA to little oil droplets, the lipid nano lipid, uh, lipid nanoparticles such as n acetamide complexing the mRNA to lipid nanoparticles not only helps it enter the cell more effectively, but also prevents it from being recycled as quickly so it hangs around your system a bit longer. I couldn't find any specific numbers about how long the vaccine mRNA hangs around in your system, but I think it's reasonable to assume maybe a couple days. But just remember, mRNA isn't magic, it's just a molecule. And as a molecule, it has some pretty well-defined properties. Just because you don't know the limitations of something doesn't mean it doesn't have them. Your car isn't gonna magically grow wings and fly away, and similarly, the mRNA vaccine isn't gonna suddenly turn you into Paul McCrane from Robocop. Next, 
Knowing what you know now, you can probably answer the next question. Can you get COVID from the vaccine? The answer is no, of course not. You knew this one. The vaccine only codes for the viral spike protein, which is just a fraction of the whole virus. Going back to the car analogy, it's like giving somebody instructions on how to make a tire. You wouldn't expect them to somehow accidentally make the entire functioning car. Similarly, the vaccine can't make the whole live virus, which I put in air quotes That's because- That's an excellent point. I'm glad that came up. It's controversial whether or not viruses are truly alive as they lack uh, internal metabolism and the ability to replicate on their own. You get the mRNA vaccine, you know how it works, great. But when the needle goes in your arm, what is actually being injected? The Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine is a white to off-white, sterile, preservative-free, frozen suspension for intramuscular injection. The vaccine is preservative free. If you look at the ingredient list, it's basically the mRNA that we talked about suspended in these lipid nanoparticles. 4-hydroxybutylazinidylbishexane once. Where is he? Just when you actually need him to help out. Guess he's gone. Anyway, basically teeny tiny little oil droplets. Looks like there's even a little bit of sugar in there, so might make for a tasty treat in a pinch. Point is, there's nothing weird in there, and there certainly isn't room for a microchip. Next. Now that we know what's in the syringe, brings us to our next question. What's it like to get the vaccine, and what kind of side effects should you expect? Some people end up with a mild flu-like syndrome, but honestly, this is to be expected. Remember, your body is forming an immune response to the spike protein, and this can make you feel kind of crappy. In fact, a lot of what makes you feel crappy when you're sick is not the actual germ, but it's your immune response fighting it. But there is not, repeat, not any live virus in or caused by the vaccine. It's because the vaccine just codes for the Spike protein, right, right. Most commonly people have site reactions, so pain and irritation at the injection site. Fever, fatigue, headache, vomiting and diarrhea. I feel like everything causes that. Lunch can cause that. Your immune system will sweep up all the spike protein in your system and your cells will recycle all the mRNA. So the vaccine is one limited burst. You get your spike protein, you get your immune response, and then it's done. Hard to say exactly, but ballpark the entire process from needle in your arm to your body mopping up the last of the spike protein, maybe a couple days. Contrast that with actually having COVID-19. In that case, you have replicating virus trashing your body and blowing shit everywhere for up to three weeks. The RNA, the genetic material from the virus, can be detectable for weeks or months afterwards. You might have heard of people having persistently positive tests for weeks or even months after their infection, that's what the test is detecting, the genetic material from the virus. Even though there's no replicating virus, it's still there. Compared to the vaccine, the disease has a much longer period of active virus wreaking havoc in your system, and also a much longer period of symptoms, inflammation, all that kind of badness that can progress to the chronic symptoms we see with COVID long haulers. And as far as chronic symptoms go, the participants in the trial were followed for a median, median, of two months. Granted, the study is supposed to run out to 18 months, but given how briefly the vaccine is actually active in your system, I'd highly doubt that there's gonna be any sort of weird latent side effects that will pop up outside of the time frame we've already been monitoring participants. This is an area that needs ongoing research, but safe to say I would much rather have the vaccine than the disease. Next, what about pregnant women and children? Well, what about pregnant women and children? And not just the men, but the women and the children too. Right now, there just isn't enough data to say. For instance, the vaccine trial specifically excluded kids under the age of 16 and pregnant women, so we just don't have that data. ACOG, which is the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, for instance, issued a statement saying that pregnancy or breastfeeding shouldn't interfere with somebody getting a vaccine who otherwise qualifies. This is an area that needs ongoing research. If I've already had COVID-19 or I have COVID-19 antibodies, do I still need the vaccine? Short answer, you likely will. People who recover from COVID-19 likely have some immunity, but it's unclear how strong that immunity is and also how long it will last. Some studies show varying levels of protection of the antibodies that we make following a COVID infection and whether or not they're neutralizing, meaning able to take out the virus. 
So even if you test positive for COVID antibodies, there's no guarantee that you're protected from the virus. Reinfection is uncommon, but real. Other studies show that levels of these antibodies may diminish or disappear over time. Protection from the vaccine is very good, again, 95%. And the studies show that the antibodies people produce in response to the vaccine are indeed neutralizing. The vaccine also generates a very good cell-mediated response, so it cues up all them CD4s and CD8s to go eat coronavirus. So far, this response seems durable, meaning that it doesn't fade over time. Granted, some study participants have only been monitored for a couple months, so only time will tell how permanent this really is. But so far, the protection from the vaccine seems more consistent and reliable than the protection that people have from simply recovering from COVID on their own. This is an area which, surprise, needs ongoing research. Can a vaccinated person transmit coronavirus. Unclear. That's not one of the things the study specifically looked at, but a vaccine isn't like a big glass wall that prevents anything from getting in. All it does is prime your immune system to recognize a germ, in this case the virus, and mop it up before it can cause any real harm. Is there a period of time where vaccinated people can be contagious? Who knows? But if most people are vaccinated, even if the virus is still being asymptomatically transmitted, it won't really matter because the virus is just gonna go to another person who's already vaccinated and immune. Because the window of contagiousness before your immune system gets rid of the virus would be small, and also COVID can only live in the body for so long, odds are the virus would die out in the population before it's able to skip person to person. This is an area which needs ongoing research. Are you protected against COVID after the first dose? Seems a little bit, but certainly not completely. The way the trial is set up makes it difficult to answer this one, but there seems to be some protection after the first dose. However, you have to wait until seven days after the second dose in order to get peak protection. Will the vaccine be mandatory? The Pfizer and Moderna vaccines just receive what's called emergency use authorization. This allows an investigational medication or vaccine to be given in advance of formal approval when the situation is dire enough that the benefits outweigh the risks. Clearly, the pandemic qualifies as this sort of thing. It'll be up to individual companies to make their own policy, but for instance, legally, I don't think anyone can make you take the vaccine, especially before it's gotten FDA approval, which is a very lengthy process. Will you eventually need a vaccine to step on a plane or go to a concert? Who knows? That is thankfully not up to me. But for what it's worth, I think the best way to get people not to take a vaccine is to try to strong arm them into doing it. This brings us to our last question. No bullshit. Doc, should I get the vaccine? I've been making a specific point of not telling people what to do, but just consider this. Right now, there are no known chronic or lasting side effects to the vaccine, whereas people are getting absolutely up from actual COVID infections. I see it myself every day. All the long-term possible bad things that could happen with this vaccine right now are what ifs. What if there are fertility issues? What if there are autoimmune issues? What if, what if, what if? We have no reason to believe that any of those things will actually happen, and you can certainly let your imagination run wild. I'm 35, and I don't particularly want scarred up lungs and a stroke, which are very real things that can happen with COVID. You make your own decisions, but the more I know about the vaccine and the virus, the more I'm happy that I got my vaccine. If you got something out of this, please like, share, and subscribe. We'll see you in the next video.